on the southern coast of Australia, on the shores and islands of the Indian Ocean, lies a creature like no other on the planet. A creature so unique in design and condition that they can only be found on the southern coastal environments of South and Western Australia. The Australian sea lion. The Australian sea lion is the only pinniped species endemic to Australia, being one of six existing sea lion species found on the planet. With a population of roughly 10,500, they are now unfortunately one of the rarest. What you're looking at here at Seal Bay is one of the rarest seal species left on the planet. Uh, we've got roughly 1,000 sea lions here, uh, which makes up about, oh, it's the third largest colony for the species. Uh, South Australian Research and Development Institute, SARDI, did a comprehensive statewide survey of the Australian sea lion late last year and believes that there's now approximately 10,500 uh, of these animals left in the wild. We actually found out through this statewide survey that the population declining at a rate of about 4.4% per breeding season. Here at Seal Bay it's a little bit slower at 1% to 2% per breeding season and the reason we believe that there is a decline is one, they haven't recovered from um, hunting days back in the early 1800s but also there seems to be an issue with fisheries bycatch, so interactions with our um, fishing industry. In the 1700s and 1800s the Australian sea lion was hunted commercially to practically extinction. Before this time, it is estimated that the population spread through the Bass Strait and coastal environments of northern Tasmania, but has never recovered to occupy its former range. The population, now classified as endangered, continues to struggle in its efforts to recover. 83% of Australian sea lions are found in South Australian waters, with the remaining 17% on the southern coast of Western Australia. Although history demonstrates the impacts humans have played in the survival of the Australian sea lion, there are now modern day practices that are further contributing to their perpetual decline. I'm Peter Shaughnessy. I'm an honorary research associate at the South Australian Museum. I've been here for 10 or 11 years and before that I was at CSIRO Wildlife and Ecology in Canberra for 20 odd years. And before that I was in South Africa as a research scientist working on fur seals. So I've worked on seals most of my career. Well, the problem with Australian sea lions is that they feed on the bottom and the commercial shark industry sets its nets on the bottom and sea lions get entangled in those nets and they drown. So it's what we refer to as bycatch. The Australian sea lion is a benthic feeder with a diet consisting mainly of cephalopods, crustaceans and fish species. Benthic feeders hunt on the ocean floor, searching sponge gardens, sandy shelves and rocky environments for bottom-dwelling prey. Being a benthic feeder requires impressive diving skills, descending to often deep, treacherous environments to hunt. 
When searching for food, an adult Australian sea lion may dive to depths beyond 100 metres in its pursuit for prey. While hunting, Australian sea lions will dive continuously for days at a time without rest. Different to the likes of fur seals who can potentially spend weeks at sea exploring the environment for food, the fur seal has the ability to rest at the ocean's surface before continuing on with its search for prey. The Australian sea lion will hunt continuously, day and night, for up to three days at a time, before hauling out on land for extended periods to rest. Within this practice of deep sea hunting, the risks extend beyond the depths at which they explore. Shark nets and cray pots deployed by the commercial fishing industry also hunt the prey found at this depth of ocean, where interactions between Australian sea lions and fishing equipment causes unfortunate entanglements and drownings. So particularly to gill net fishing, um, that's that monofilament shark netting that drags on the bottom of the ocean. We believe it accounts for about 66% of sea lion entanglements because sea lions are a benthic feeder, so they're feeding on the bottom of the ocean and they're looking, at, they're looking for the cephalopods, uh, crustaceans, and so that's where there's going to be interactions with those nets down there and also with the prey pots as well. Although the fishing industry creates threats for the Australian sea lion unnatural to their environment, the species also shares the water with a predator. The predator naturally designed to put them at the top of the food chain. The great white shark. I'm Lauren Meyer. I'm a PhD candidate at Flinders University and I specialize in biochemical ecology. And all that is is a really fancy way of saying understanding how food webs fit together. And in particular, I look at white sharks and what they eat and what habitats are vital for their diet. Within Australia and throughout the world, pinnipeds, which are just your seals and sea lions, are actually really vital in the diet of white sharks. Now, an average size white shark around three and a half meters can survive on approximately one full size pinniped a week. So they really involve a lot of, uh, that blubber is really, really quite valuable for a food source for the white sharks. Now, we start seeing white sharks incorporate pinnipeds into their diet really quite young, on average around three meters, but on occasion we see them down to 2.7 meters with remnants of seals and sea lions actually in their gut but most of the time it's up when they get around the three and a half meter mark, which is usually when the male sharks mature, that we see them feeding quite a bit on the pinnipeds around Australia, as well as throughout the world. Although in this environment, Australian sea lions are a main food source in the diet of a great white shark, this connection of hunter and prey is one of natural evolution and is normal practice beyond their decline. The breeding cycle of an Australian sea lion is one of strict requirements and extended nurturing. With a cycle of roughly 18 months, the Australian sea lion holds the longest gestation period of any pinniped species, reducing breeding opportunities by approximately one third when compared to other annually breeding pinnipeds. They have a very strange breeding cycle. Um, almost every other seal species, and there are about 36 seal species, they breed annually, most of them during the summer, some in the spring, but the Australian sea lion has an 18 month interval between breeding. So that means if they breed one summer, then they'll breed not the following winter, but the one after in 18 months time. The other tricky thing or interesting thing about them is that each colony or most of the colonies breed at different times. That is, they're asynchronous. The adult females are phylopatric, and that means that they 
return to the colony where they were born to breed. Now the corollary of that is that if a sea lion colony becomes very much reduced, then the only way it's going to increase again is from reproduction within its own colony. And if it disappears altogether, that's it. Nobody will go back there to breed. And that's quite different to the fur seal on our coast, which are quite, in a way, venturesome. They move off and they find new colonies to breed. And that's one of the methods how the, uh, fur seal, the local fur seal has been increasing. It establishes new colonies at uh, what they consider to be good sites. In an effort to mitigate the impacts of commercial fishing on the Australian sea lion's endeavour to recover, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, who controls commercial fishing operations off the coast of South Australia and Western Australia, has introduced restrictions applying to areas of high use and significance to the Australian sea lion. Safety zones, bycatch monitoring and marine parks have been introduced in an effort to aid in recovery. The uh, Australian Fisheries Management Authority, based in Canberra, controls the shark fishery off the coast of South Australia and Western Australia, and they've taken a lot of steps um, in the period 2010 to 2012 to, to uh, reduce this problem. Things like um, there's now a no-go zone around every sea lion colony in South Australia of about 20 kilometres. And that no-go zone on the south coast of Kangaroo Island is far more than just around the sea lion colony. So that's a really good step. Uh, in South Australian water, which is where 83% of the species lives, is they've divided it into seven particular zones. And within these zones, you can bycatch only one or two Australian sea lions. And once that trigger limit is met, then that zone is shut down from gillnet fishing for a year and a half. Now, the good thing is, is that these boats all have cameras that are filming the nets as they're being dragged up into the boat. So it's not an honesty system. Three cameras, one of which focuses on the net as it comes out of the water, because a lot of the sea lions actually drop out of the net before they get onto the deck and the people on the boat don't actually see the sea lion. So any seal that comes up onto the boat in the net is deemed to be an Australian sea lion unless uh, the camera shows it's to be a fur seal. All the shark boats have satellite trackers on them so they can pass through those no fishing zones but they're not to fish in those zones. And that should have quite an effect on uh, relieving the problem. So with these mitigation strategies and because of um, how sensitive and unique the breeding structure is for the Australian sea lion, we're still unsure yet as to whether pup production has been affected and whether it has halted the decline and that's because these um, mitigation strategies have only been in place to last four to five years. So time will tell there. The sea lion population should be increasing mm -hmm. and is it? Well, at Seal Bay on Kangaroo Island, which is the colony we monitor most annually, then there are indications that maybe the population, the pup population is starting to increase. But several other colonies that we've been monitoring, they still have been declining. Now, the problem is that the Australian sea lions don't produce a pup until they're aged six. Their first pup, but maybe at four and a half, a few of them, but most of them not till they're age six. These measures that were introduced by AFMA um, were between 2010 and 2012. So we don't really expect to see a recovery of the population just yet. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that these measures that AFMA has put in place to restrict the bycatch of sea lions will, in a few more years, um, have an effect and we'll start to see the numbers go up.
There are many inequalities within the structural design of this species that have ultimately worked against their efforts to expand. But it is within this uniqueness that we identify how special this creature is and how essential it is that we secure their place in the future of our natural world. The way in which they nurture their young the extent in which they will explore the ocean in search for food, their devotion to their colony, all aspects of the Australian sea lion's design manifests care, intelligence and commitment. And it is these qualities that we must embrace to nurture beyond decline. To encourage. of the Australian sea lion.